there's a poem in the canon where Mahagasapa is talking about the beauties of the wilderness and how refreshing it is to stay in the wilderness. Historically, it's interesting because it's the oldest wilderness poetry we know of, appreciating not only nature but wild nature, totally away from farming and other human activities. And it's also interesting that Mahagaspa, who has the reputation for being so stern, could be so appreciative of the beauties of nature. But then as the poem concludes, the real joy of being out in the wilderness is that it's easier to get the mind to settle down. It's a good place for developing strong concentration, because there are so few distractions. But so many dangers. Things can happen very easily in the wilderness. And you're all alone, or you're with very few people. And getting help is difficult. I know someone who was part of a research project way up on Axel Heiberg Island. And she's going to spend a month or two alone on the island. And she was all excited about going. And then as the plane left after dropping her off, she suddenly realized that anything could happen, that she'd have nobody to help. After a while she got used to it, but still there was that sense of terror that swept over her for a few minutes. And the realization that we're so dependent on the comforts of civilization. that we tend to forget about them. It's strange. We're so dependent, and yet we forget. This is the way it is throughout conditioned reality. And being in the wilderness brings it more sharply into life. Conditionality is so fleeting. Things arise because of conditions, and the conditions are always changing. They talk about the river of time flowing. And as with any river, you stick your finger into the river and you stick it in again, and it's not the same river. It's changed. Or whatever it is you cling to, as the Buddha said, simply the amount of time it takes to decide that you're going to cling to something, that thing has already changed. It's already changed into something else. So both because we have the beauties of nature and the quiet of nature and also the dangers of nature out here, it makes you realize you've got to find a refuge inside. That's what the concentration is. Concentration, of course, here covers both insight and tranquility, because the practice of getting the mind to settle down requires that you understand the mind. You don't just force it to be still. You're trying to understand the conditions in the mind so you can create something that's relatively lasting. But even this is not an ultimate refuge. As the Buddha said, the essence of all experiences, or the essence of all actions, he uses the word dhamma. It seems to have a special sense in your experiences or actions, is release. You find pleasure here, say, in the being out in the wilds. The conditions have been ideal for the past week, and yet you can't change them. I found myself, when I went down to the meadow, sitting there, and I was, only had a few minutes to sit there. And the first thought that came to my mind was, I hope I can do this again. Of course, what that means is the experience itself is not satisfying. It keeps changing, changing, changing. If it's something you like, you hope it comes again, but then it's not enough. 
It's only when you can dig down into the mind in the midst of that experience and find release. That's when you found something of true value, or in the Buddha's word, the heartwood of that experience. Everything else has totally devoid of essence, but this is the essence. This doesn't mean the trees have release or the, the grass and the meadows have release. It's simply the mind as it's experiencing the trees and the grass and the sunlight coming through the branches. If you're going to look for essence, you have to look at in the mind that's experiencing these things, but not that's not attached to them. That's not clinging to them. Even your sense of yourself, you as a being, it's a product of attachment. That's the Buddhist definition. Sometimes you hear it said that Buddha, the Buddha said there really is no being there. There is no you there. But he never said that. When the monk once asked him what it what a being is. And the Buddha gave him an answer. Wherever there's attachment, that's where there's going to be a being. What the Buddha calls the process of I-making and my-making. And it's a process of trying to pin something down inside. But as long as you're holding on to experiences, even as you're trying to pin something down, it's already changed. So you have to look at the part of the mind that is not creating an eye around this, not creating a sense of passion or attachment. And that's where the essence of that experience is going to be, and the freedom. And as the Buddha said, when the mind is free, it's released everywhere. It's not confined to any particular location. Doesn't fasten on anything. So that's the quality of mind we're trying to develop. It can be with good things and bad things. And not make its happiness depend on the good things or bad things. We get the mind still so that we can see the actions of the mind as it's creating passion around something, passion or aversion. And we get the mind really still and very alert, and we can start seeing our delusions as well. And realizing that whatever we create out of those things is simply going to fall apart. Your sense of you, who you are, is created out of things that are going to fall apart. It's not that there's no you. You've created this you. But you have to keep on creating it. And the happiness for you that you're going to create out of the world is going to depend on things that are going to be changing all the time. As long as you have passion for them. So the Buddha is not saying there is no you there, it's just you is a construct. Build out of passion. And as long as we see that it's worth the effort, we're going to hold on to it. So we meditate to see there's something of greater value. So that we're not simply here appreciating the beauties of nature, we're making use of them. This is a passage where the Buddha talks about a monk going out in the wilderness. He sits down and he just holds on simply to the perception of wilderness, he realizes all the disturbances of village life, all the disturbances of human society are not here. The state is empty of that. But there is still a disturbance of being in wilderness. The disturbance there, of course, is what comes from the dangers, the aloneness in the face of what, what could happen to your body, what could happen to the things you have. So you drop that perception and you simply go to the perception of the elements. And then from the elephant <coughs> excuse me, and then from the elements you go through space, and through awareness itself, and up through the different levels of concentration. In each case you realize that the disturbance that was there in the previous state is no longer there.
And so finally you can get to the mind, get the mind to a point where it has no more greed, aversion, and delusion for things through this process of progressively emptying itself of disturbance. And that's your dwelling. You're not dwelling in nature anymore. You're dwelling in emptiness. Of course, emptiness is not located anywhere. So we use this location where the air is clean, the temperature has been just right for the past week, it's been quiet. We could simply enjoy the, the location, enjoy the pleasures of nature, or we could put them to use. Because in the Buddhist teachings, even though he stresses the, the importance of wilderness, is because it's useful for training the mind. So if you're working on getting the mind more concentrated or trying to work on gaining some insight into how the mind creates suffering out of all kinds of things, good and bad, remember that's the purpose of being here. This because it opens all kinds of opportunities for the mind. And our time here is fleeting, so make the best use of it. Because when time goes, as things go with time, they just disappear, disappear. There's a saying in Thai that time consumes everything as it consumes itself. But if you find something of real value, and especially if you can find what's essential in all of this, which is the release, then you do have something to show for the, the fact that time has passed. And the goodness of passing time, even though it will disappear, the goodness of release never changes. That's why it's of essential worth.